Excellent. So I think, uh, yeah, that's probably the last uh, formal Monday seminar this term, unless we have some surprises. So Katrina Ligas from the Hebrew University will tell us about privacy, stability, generalization, uh, yeah, scientific experiments. Okay. All right, great. Thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about differential privacy, um, this sort of stability notion of privacy, um, and some of the exciting connections that have been made over the past five or so years, um, that where this notion has turned out to have some really interesting implications in the realm of statistical validity. Uh, so you don't need to have heard of differential privacy or statistical validity. Uh, for this talk, I'm really going to try to build up all the pieces that we need along the way. Um, a lot of this talk is actually going to be based on work by other folks um, who first built these connections uh, a number of years ago, but the exposition that I'll follow in this talk um, is from some joint work with Christopher Jung, Seth Neal, Aaron Roth, Saeed Sharif and Mel Vajeri, and Moshe Schenfeld. Um, Seth has actually since moved to Harvard, um, but previously all the other folks except Moshe were at UPenn and Moshe was a student of mine here at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Okay, so let's dive in, um, but feel free to stop me, ask questions along the way. Um, don't, don't let me just forge ahead if, if things are unclear. Okay, so the plan for today is I'm gonna give you a little primer on differential privacy, sort of what it is, uh, how it's defined, why it's defined that way, um, some of the nice properties that it enjoys. Then we're going to completely switch gears um, and talk about this problem of adaptive data analysis. Again, you don't need to know what this means yet. I will explain what I mean by this. And then we're gonna put those two sort of remote looking pieces together um, and try to understand how differential privacy gives us some interesting tools um, for protecting ourselves against adaptivity in data analysis. And then towards the end, I'll try to give you some hints about you know, where, where this research agenda more broadly is going and things that we've been thinking about more recently. Okay, so let's dive in. Um, the model that we're gonna be working with today is one where we have databases uh, that consist of unordered collections of data elements. So this scripty X is our data domain and a data set is just a collection of elements from this domain. Um, we're gonna run around with data sets of size N today. Um, and you should think of each element of a data set. So each of those elements from the data domain as belonging to a person. So a database is a collection of N people's data. Um, and we might be worried about people's privacy in settings like this, because what we're want, gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna take a database like this. It's a collection of people's data. And we're going to want to answer some sequence of queries on the data. Um, and formally, we're going to think of this or sort of model this interaction as we have some mechanism M. Um, and that mechanism M has access to a database. And that mechanism N M is going to be fed queries. And it's going to return responses to those queries. OK? And formally, the model that we'll think about is one where those queries are actually being, being generated by some analyst. So the, the picture that we're thinking about is one in which there's this continual sort of cycle of interaction between the M, the mechanism, and the A, the analyst, which I might sometimes call an adversary. Um, and basically, the analyst is saying, here's my query, and the mechanism is saying, here's my response to that query on the data set, and this con cycle continues. Um, and we can think about sort of wrapping that whole interaction between the M and the A um, in some bubble that we'll call interact. And basically what interact does is it takes a database, it takes a mechanism, and it takes this analyst, and it runs the interaction. So it generates the sequence of query answer pairs that result from this interaction. Um, the mechanism can be randomized, the analyst can be randomized. Uh, and interact is sort of the, 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 our way of thinking about the process that takes in a mechanism and something that generates queries in a database and tells us sort of what comes out as a result. Okay. And- Katrina, 
Yes. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, you're, are you going to say that uh, a good thing to start thinking about is where M is trivial, where the queries go straight to the database? Sure, yeah. So, so one thing that, that you might think about, sure, is you could think about um, the queries are just asking for the database, the mechan mechanism could be returning the actual database or it could be giving some noise. So far, I haven't constrained the mechanism in any way to be accurate or talked about any notion of accuracy, but we'll get there in some sense. And we'll start to, to want to think about what it means to be accurate. We'll have some notions of accuracy for this. So I want to sort of back up a, a bit in time um, to talk about sort of where the sort of foundations of rigorous mathematical reasoning about this kind of a process and the privacy risk that entails um, come from. And really this whole study was born um, from the work of the Nisim in 2003, uh, where they really gave shape to our understanding um, of privacy and how we can sort of rigorously model it in a number of ways. So first of all, they gave us some vocabulary for talking about issues like blatant non-privacy. So for example, this definition that says that a mechanism is blatantly non-private, if you can use its outputs in order to come up with a database that's almost the same as the input database. That's clearly a bad thing for privacy. Um, if we're trying to protect the privacy of the elements of the input database, we probably ought not produce outputs that allow one to reconstruct most of the original database. Um, in addition, sort of beyond this, uh, the Dinora and Nisim work showed us that it's really fundamentally impossible for any mechanism to answer all queries accurately and maintain privacy. So for example, imagine that this database elements are just zeros and ones and queries consist of vectors of zeros and ones um, of length n. And the way that you are intended to answer a query is by telling me of that vector, uh, what fraction of the uh, elements that it highlighted as ones actually were one in the database. Um, so we'll call these inner product queries. And one of the, the first theorems in the Diner and Nisim paper is one showing that answering all inner product queries to within some alpha accuracy allows you to reconstruct all but a four alpha fraction of the coordinates of the underlying data set. And so um, this sort of thinking about reconstruction in this way um, was really formative for thinking about privacy. Um, how do these reconstruction attacks work? Intuitively, what's going on is you think of every answer to a query as constraining the space of possible databases that could have generated that answer in some way. And so as you accumulate answers to more and more queries, the, sp the space of possible databases becomes more and more constrained. You can think of this just as sort of a mathematical programming problem. Given all of these constraints, you can solve for sort of a likely database that could have generated these answers. And, and it turns out you can do this quite well. Um, and then furthermore, you, even if you don't answer all of the inner product queries, um, they also show a theorem that says I, that even if you just answer some n random inner product queries um, to within some error c over root n, that this also is going to be blatantly non-private. So this already starts to give us some sense that there's going to be some real sort of fundamental trade-offs between privacy and accuracy. We're not going to be able to answer all queries about a data set or as many queries as we might like about a data set up to arbitrary accuracy. There's going to be some tension or trade-off there. And as we get more accuracy, that's going to affect privacy guarantees, or you can think of it as affecting the number of queries that we'll be able to potentially answer. And you can see this square root of root n, this is going to be something that's going to recur as a theme as we go on. Um, but intuitively, it seems that there's some sort of limit um, in terms of the number of queries that we can answer. Uh, and, and so, and actually, the, there's sort of additional reconstruction work where this gets even worse. Um, even if you only get you know, pretty good accuracy on you know, slightly more than half of the queries, the rest of the queries you answer is garbage. You can still do reconstruction. Um, you can even do reconstruction efficiently under certain conditions. So the sort of there's pretty bad news uh, about reconstruction on the basis of accurate queries. And all of this was really the foundation for the introduction of the notion of differential privacy. Uh, so differential privacy 
is a notion that was introduced in 2006 by Dwork, Scher, and Simon Smith. Um, you should think of differential privacy as sort of a stability property of a mechanism. So a mechanism is differentially private if for all analysts that generate the queries and for any two neighboring databases that differ in one uh, person's information and for all subsets of the outcome space that you might be interested in. And here the outcome space, we'll think of it as the sort of induced uh, sequences of query response pairs. The probability that we end up in that subset of the outcome space under the first database S is almost the same as the probability that we end up in that subset of the outcome space under the neighboring data, database S prime. So intuitively what's going on here is that differential privacy is saying that even if we were to make a small change in the underlying data set, that, should, that, that, that should have a limited effect on the behavior of the algorithm, of the mechanism. And it should have this limited effect um, in this particular sense of closeness where we have both an epsilon parameter and a delta parameter here. And you notice that the, the work of the epsilon parameter is sort of allowing us some multiplicative difference in probabilities. The work of the delta parameter is allowing us some additive difference in those probabilities. Um, if you've encountered differential privacy before, which I know some of you have, um, you've maybe seen it stated slightly differently. Um, I'd sort of just point to places where it might look a little different or unfamiliar here. I'm carrying around this interact thing. Um, usually people talk about differential privacy for mechanisms. I'm sort of already baking in the interaction to hint at the interaction that we're going to be talking about later on. I'm talking here about um, privacy for databases of fixed size n. Um, typically, we try in differential privacy to actually to talk about databases of variable size. And then the notion of neighboring is actually additional removal of a single individual from the data set. That's a more powerful definition. But for convenience here, we're going to stick to databases of size n. Um, and if you haven't encountered differential privacy before, it's, it's worth sort of digesting for a little bit, sort of what does this guarantee look like? What does it mean? Um, you can think of that e to the epsilon multiplicative factor as just sort of a one plus epsilon kind of a multiplicative factor. So um, as we allow the behavior of these, uh, of the mechanism to be more and more different across different databases, the results are in some sense coding, encoding more and more information or potentially encoding more and more information about the underlying data sets. Um, one thing to notice is that the, the guarantee that you get when your delta is zero is really a qualitatively different guarantee than if you have a non-zero delta. Um, so if you encounter differential privacy, you'll often encounter the variant that's just epsilon differential privacy. So with no delta, that means delta equals zero. And there the nice thing is that you can't have a smoking gun. There, there can be, if you just have epsilon comma zero differential privacy, then any outcome that has non-zero probability under any input database necessarily has non-zero probability under all possible databases. Whereas if you allow a non-zero delta, you can have a very unlikely smoking gun. Um, so it is possible very, very rarely for the output to actually, for example, say, this was my data set or Katrina was in the data set. It just has to be very rare. And typically we think about these epsilon parameters as being small constant, constants, things like 0.2, 1. Um, and we tend to think of these deltas as being cryptographically small, just to get some intuition there. So thinking from the perspective of an individual who is faced with the question, you know, should I allow my data to be used in the computation that is going to enjoy the guarantee of differential privacy, from the perspective of that individual, sort of the process of reasoning is, is sort of this realization that differential privacy means that approximately the same consequences of the computation will hold regardless of whether or not you participate or regardless of whether or not you falsify your data or provide you know, defaults, zero data or whatever, whatever it is that, that falsifying might look like for you. So from an individual's perspective, you can't have very much impact on the outcome of the algorithm. And so you can see naturally why this might be uh, interpreted as sort of one version of privacy. Of course, it doesn't capture all um, versions of privacy that, that get discussed in philosophy and other literatures. Um, but certainly there, there's something quite natural here. 
um, that we're preventing the behavior from uh, strongly reflecting the presence or absence of an individual, but yet hopefully we're still allowing for behavior of mechanisms that capture aggregate properties of the data set or sort of trends, correlations. We hope that this is still gonna allow us to do things like machine learning and statistics, okay? Questions about differential privacy? Yeah, any questions for people who never saw it before? Yeah, so, so I mean, I don't know if uh, you said it in the beginning, but uh, I think the, uh, you call the mechanism an, anal an analyst, but uh, you know, the, the, maybe the most or the first uh, um, common example is medical experiments. Uh, you want people to participate, you want uh, uh, you know, information about people's uh, you know, illnesses and uh, health conditions and so on to be available to scientists in order to whatever, design drugs and so on. But you want the people participating in these experiments to feel secure that nobody will know whether they were uh, in the experiment or uh, whether they were tested positive for something that they, you know, it's private to them. So that's a, that's the most, uh, I guess, uh, common example. Of course, there are lots of other scenarios where this, uh, you know, kind of privacy is desired. Yeah, yeah, and, and thinking along those lines, if you think from the perspective of an individual who's concerned about some sort of possible future consequences of having participated in this study, what differential privacy says to you is you sort of imagine those bad future worlds that you don't wanna have happen. The probability that we end up in those bad future worlds when you don't participate is almost exactly the same as when you do participate. Um, and that's a pretty powerful guarantee, I think, for an individual to receive. Okay, so differential privacy has really taken off over the past 15 or so years. Um, there's been a lot of work establishing, yes, that you can do really interesting statistical analyses um, and machine learning uh, subject to guarantees of differential privacy. In many cases, there's really nice compatibility between this guarantee and what you want to achieve when you're doing sort of aggregate work on statistical databases. Um, there have also been a number of really interesting sort of uh, large scale deployments of differential privacy. If you use an iPhone, you're using differential privacy. If you've used the Chrome browser in the past, you've used differential privacy. If you uh, are a US resident, your data will be treated with differential privacy in the 2020 census. Um, so we're seeing more and more sort of adoption of this vocabulary and toolkit um, to guarantee privacy. Some of the reasons that I think differential privacy has been so uh, influential are that it enjoys some really fundamental, convenient and beautiful mathematical properties. So briefly, the, the three that usually get pulled out here are group privacy, post-processing and composition. Um, group privacy is gonna be sort of less central to our discussion today, but I'll just mention it because I think it's, it's nice and helps sort of capture the intuition behind differential privacy a bit. Um, so as I stated it, differential privacy was a guarantee protecting the privacy of a single individual. So I said, if, if we were to change the data of one person in the underlying database, then the behavior of the mechanism should be constrained to not change very much. But that actually immediately implies that if I were to change the data of just a handful of people, that also the mechanism's behavior would still be fairly constrained, not quite as constrained, but nearly as constrained. And you can see this by just chaining together a sequence of changes in the underlying data set and seeing that you get a change together sequence of guarantees about how these probabilities are allowed to differ. The second pro uh, property of differential privacy that's really crucial is a post-processing guarantee. Um, I'm not gonna state these guarantees formally because they're, they're not core to the argument here, but I just think it's important sort of culturally to, to get this exposure. Um, and what does post-processing say? Intuitively, it says, that if I do a computation that enjoys a guarantee of differential privacy, and then I subsequently process the results of that computation in some way, that that subsequent processing can't degrade the privacy guarantees. So as long as those subs that subsequent processing didn't manage to go back to the original data set or didn't somehow access the hidden randomness of my mechanism, then the only thing you can do by post-processing a mechanism is you can make the privacy better. You can't make it worse. And that's an incredibly powerful guarantee to have and makes differential privacy sort of a really robust notion. The third uh, mathematical property of this notion, which is gonna be really crucial today, 
is the composition property. And intuitively what composition says is that if I do something that's differentially private and then I do something else that's differentially private, that I can reason about the overall privacy loss, that I have a language for talking about how privacy losses add up. The most basic version of this theorem really is just that. If I have a database and I do one, composite, uh, one computation that's epsilon delta differentially private and I do another computation that's epsilon delta differentially private, that the combination of those two together is two epsilon, two delta differentially private, because there's literal, literal adding up of those two computations guarantees. And these types of guarantees, these composition guarantees are really, really powerful for allowing us to design more sophisticated algorithms that enjoy guarantees of differential privacy. Because what composition says is that if you have a bunch of small sort of little Lego brick components, little you know, simple algorithms that are differentially private where you understand what their differential privacy guarantee is, then you can assemble them into more complex algorithms and you can reason about the privacy guarantees of those more complex algorithms simply by, in some sense, just adding up the components that you used. And that ends up being really convenient. So there are sort of a sequence of increasingly sophisticated composition theorems that you can prove about differential privacy. Um, the one that I'm listing here comes from work of Dwork, Roth, Blum, and Vedan from 2010. And this theorem is more sophisticated than that basic adding up theorem that I mentioned in the previous slide in two ways. So what this theorem says is that if you run k epsilon comma delta differentially private algorithms, then the overall privacy guarantee, first let's focus on the last line of the theorem, the overall privacy guarantee, sort of the harms add up, not linearly in K, but as the square root of K. So that's the first improvement is that we're getting not a sort of a linear adding up of the privacy harms, but we're getting the square root of K um, summation of the privacy harms. The second piece where this theorem is crucially more sophisticated than what I said before is that this theorem actually allows for the choice of subsequent computations to be based on the results of previous computations. So I can pick what query I run on, on the basis of the results that I've seen for previous queries. So I can run a query, look at the results, think hard about what that means, and use that as the basis to pick the next query. And then I can see the results and I can use the previous results of both of those queries to help me choose the next query. And that adaptivity is gonna end up being incredibly useful and incredibly powerful for us. So why intuitively are we able to get this sort of sublinear aggregation of harms? Intuitively what's going on here is that the expected privacy losses are in some sense much better than the worst case privacy losses. And you can do sort of a martingale analysis to get concentration there. Okay, questions and, so far? And in particular, if Delta was zero, then uh, you don't lose uh, anything on the Delta side, only on the Epsilon you lose the square root K. So if you're if your delta is zero, then then you can't get this uh, sort of guarantee because if your if your delta guarantees are going to be zero, then then the the epsilon prime is going to blow up. Um, epsilon but, prime depends on delta prime, not on delta. Okay, so okay, yes, yeah, if your original delta is zero, um, then you can use this delta prime to sort of trade off between your epsilon guarantee and your delta guarantee. Right, but the K will not appear on the delta. And the K part. won't appear in the delta part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which is really nice. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, maybe uh, just to say this is uh, extremely counterintuitive, at least at first glance, because you can run a uh, quadratically, you know, almost quadratically many queries on a size and database. And yeah. They'll be private, even though it seemed like we could only. <laughs> Because only uh, you know, after a linear number of queries, you have to yeah, reveal everything. So it's not these are mechanisms that prevent this. So yeah, so this is actually the sort of very reminiscent of the square root of n that showed up here before, um, which was sort of a hint uh, that the errors are going to aggregate, you know, at least in this sort of square root of n way. Yeah. Good. Um, okay. 
So that was our blazing fast introduction to differential privacy. Um, for the purposes of today's talk, we're gonna focus on a particular type of queries that our mechanisms are gonna answer. Um, these are gonna be linear queries. Um, if you prefer, think of them as statistical queries. Uh, what do I mean by these? As sort of an, an abusive notation, linear queries are defined on individual data points as returning a value between zero and one. And they're defined on data sets as returning the average value across the points in the data set, okay? Uh, these are very simple queries in some sense, but they're very powerful and they end up being really natural building blocks for doing lots of more sophisticated things. These are really gonna open up for you sort of most of the machine learning statistical kinds of things that you might wanna do on data sets. So what does differential privacy tell us for linear queries? Uh, so intuitively, what you should do if you wanna answer linear queries according to differential privacy is you should compute the right answer and then you should add some noise. What noise? Think Gaussian noise. Um, it turns out you can do a sort of some various other clever things in various other situations, but intuitively the, the thing to take here is that, you know, here's the, the best type of theorem that we can show about answering linear queries when we have no additional assumptions. Um, and the, notice, the thing to notice is that your error is growing like the square root of the size of the class of queries. So this means that you can answer sort of quadratically many queries for constant error. Um, and this is essentially an optimal guarantee as long as the data universe is large, unless you have some additional sort of way in which you're coordinating answers based on queries. Um, and the intuition for why I said um, something about the data universe being large is if you have a small data universe, then that forces some queries to have sort of implicit relationships with other queries, and then you can take advantage of that. Um, but intuitively, what we should take from this is just that we know how to answer quadratically many queries. Um, subject to guarantees of differential privacy. Questions? Okay, onward. So that was differential privacy, very briefly. Um, now we're gonna switch gears entirely, forget about privacy for a few minutes, and we're gonna tell you about a different problem. And this is the problem of adaptive data analysis. This is the problem of science. This is the problem of machine learning. So back to this picture, um, we're in a world where we're scientists and we have access to a database and we're trying to answer questions. Um, so we're the, in some sense, we're the M, um, we're getting fed questions, although usually the scientist is really the M and the A, and we're trying, trying to make sense of the world. What do we mean make sense of the world? Well, in some sense, we usually mean that actually our database that we have access to is somehow representative of some broader phenomena. We like to think of the data that we have access to in our sample as being drawn from some underlying distribution. And this is a really common phenomenon that you know, we want to understand fundamental properties, but we don't have access to the underlying distribution. We have access to a sample. Um, from the distribution, and we have to do science on a sample. You know, if you do science on humans or on animals or on cells or on, you know, anything where you have to gather together a bunch of something in order to study them, you do science on a sample. And the hope is that somehow, despite only doing science on a sample, that the findings that you get have relevance and implications for the underlying distribution. And so we can start to think about what does it mean to give a guarantee of accuracy for our mechanism? Um, and there are gonna be a couple of different kinds of accuracy that we'll look at in this talk. Um, the first one is you can talk about a mechanism satisfying sample accuracy if the answers that it gives are pretty close to the answers to the queries on the sample, so that sample from the underlying distribution. And formally, what we're doing is we're saying that if high probability, if, if with probability except beta, where probability is taken over the sampling of the data set and over the randomness of the mechanism and of the analyst who's issuing the queries, if worst case over all of the, the queries that get issued, the difference between the value of that query 
on the sample, and the answer that our mechanism chose to give is not very large, is, it, is, it, is not bigger than alpha, okay? So this is saying that we're doing science that is accurate for the sample, but what we really wanted was to do science that's accurate for the distribution. We're gonna call that distributional accuracy. And we're gonna write a very similar definition. Again, probabilities are gonna be taken over the sampling of the database and over the randomness of the mechanism and of the analyst. And here we wanna say that the worst query is not too far off. What two things are not too far off? The query evaluated on the underlying distribution and the answer that we give. So except with small probability, those two are very close, okay? So, so um, basically, as long as the sample is representative, the two will be uh, the same. So as long as the sample is representative, you can imagine sort of drawing some triangles and we'll get there in, in a minute. Yes, yeah. Good, questions? Okay, so let's set aside for the moment these sort of looming concerns about adaptivity and suppose that, that we're just trying to figure out how to do science, how to answer queries when all we have is a sample and we care about the underlying distribution. distribution. So the first tool that's gonna be relevant here is just a basic churn-off bound. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to think about what does a churn-off bound tell us about how accurate science on the sample is for the underlying distribution, okay? So remember, turnoff bounds tell you about you know, sort of behavior of, of sums of ID random variables. And the implication is that if we're gonna issue a single linear query and answer it according to the sample, then it's gonna behave similarly to the underlying distribution where except for this, you know, sort of delta failure probability, this, this square root of log two over delta over two n is what's gonna sort of be this error term here, okay? And if we wanna answer more than one query, what do you do? Well, you do a union bound. So, you know, you wanna not fail on any of them. You add up your, your failures in some sense and the, sort of cool thing to see is where does that K show up? That K shows up inside the log. So what does that mean? It means that if we're not worried about adaptivity, how many queries can we answer on a database of size N? Asymptotically, intuitively. Look at the, the relationship uh, between the N and the K. For volunteers, guys. <laughs> I can be patient. Look at the relationship between the N and the K. What's going on there? Well, it looks pretty good. It looks exponential. It looks exponential. That's really cool, right? Um, this says if you're not worried about adaptivity, go at it. You know, ask tons and tons of questions. You're going to be right. And you can just answer them on the sample, no worries. You're gonna be accurate for the underlying distribution. That's really cool. Okay, but I warned you, adaptivity is gonna come and bite us. So how is it gonna come and bite us? Um, so if the query can be a function of the data, we're clearly already in deep, deep trouble. So here's an extreme example of this. What if the query that gets issued is the query that returns one on elements that are in our sample and zero on all other possible database elements. That's a query that's going to behave probably very differently on our sample than on the underlying distribution. So for example, if your underlying distribution is just a sort of zero one vectors of length D, then you run it on the sample, you get one, you run it on the underlying distribution, you get something tiny. This is bad news, right? This is exactly what we didn't want to have happen. We answered but, a query. But how, how can you ask such a query if you have no idea what this is? There you go. So, but, you know, this is terrible news. It's overfitting. But hey, who's asking queries that are perfectly tailored to the data set? Okay. So what if you don't have access to the data set, but instead you have access to the answers of previous queries? That's a better model, right? Or a nicer model. 
So, but then even then I can just construct you a first query whose output encodes the data set. And then my second query can be that previous query. So uh, again, we get to a point very quickly where we're issuing a query whose answer is very, very different on the sample than on the underlying distribution. And we wanted to be able to do science on the sample. Okay, but you say, give me a break. This is not what scientists are doing. They're not encoding the data set with a single query and then intentionally picking the query that allows them to differentiate between the sample and the underlying distribution. You know, that, that, would, that would not make very much sense. But you can already start to see this problem of adaptivity and this problem of encoding the sample emerge even in more natural analyses. So to give maybe a slightly more natural example, um, I'm going to sort of shift our model slightly because I think it's elegant for this example. So imagine we're in a world um, where a data domain is labeled examples. So what do I mean by that? I just mean I, there are points I, in 0, 1 to the D, each of them labeled with a 0 or a 1. And our goal is classification, meaning I give you an unlabeled point and your goal is to guess what its label is, 0 or 1. Okay. So you're, you're going to be faced with this classification problem. I'm going to give you a sample of labeled data points. And now you have to come up with a classification algorithm. So here's a, a, a proposed approach that I think sounds kind of reasonable. Um, what we're going to do is first we're going to check for each of those D entries, each of those D columns in our data set, how correlated they are with the label. Okay. So we're just going to compute the probability that they match. The, and then we're going to call a feature predictive if it's substantially correlated. Say if, it, if that C sub i is greater than a half plus uh, one over root n. And then we're going to call f the set of predictive features in our data set. And now we're going to build our classifier just as a majority vote over f. So we're going to, when we get a new point in, we don't know it's, it's, it doesn't come labeled. What we have to do is we have to guess the label. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, all of you predictive features, what do you vote for this point? And we're going to take the majority. OK. So but this, this sounds is like a standard way to, uh, all standard way to fight spam. Like if it says uh, congratulations or if it says, uh, uh, right? I mean, there are some, some predictive uh, words that appear in junk email that uh, you want to uh, include in this majority vote and they are, uh, um, yeah, other words that are more tame. Exactly. Yeah, this is a very natural sort of intuitive um, sort of basic classification approach. So now let's try to understand the performance of our classifier. Okay. So let's think about the performance in two different ways. Let's compute its performance on the data sample and let's comp compute its performance on the underlying distribution. And the bad news is this, say take uniform data and labels, there exists a constant C such that with probability one minus delta, if the number of columns of your data set exceeds basically C times M, um, then the difference between the accuracy on the sample and the accuracy on the underlying distribution is gonna basically be as bad as possible. It's going to look great on the sample and it's going to be random garbage on the underlying distribution. So uh, again, adaptivity. How did adaptivity bite us here? What happened? Somehow, once you make the data set rich enough, there are going to be some arbitrary correlations here between columns and and these uh, and the labels that we're trying to predict, and we're going to find those arbitrary correlations in our data set. They're not going to hold on the underlying distribution. We can mislead ourselves very very easily with adaptivity, and this is a pattern that emerges over and over and over again, and it's been blamed for what's been labeled the statistical crisis in science. So if you like to read about science more broadly, you've probably noticed that over the past decade or so, 
We've seen reproduction problem after reproduction problem. The field after field that does data-driven science has been sort of plagued by the realization that they've been misleading themselves in various ways. And one of the factors that's been blamed for this problem is exactly this, data-dependent analysis, the garden of forking paths. The, the idea that often when we do science on data, we ask a question, we try it out on the data set, we look at the answers, and the answers inspire the next question that we ask. It's a perfectly natural thing to have happen. That's how, in some sense, science has to work. It has to make progress by building on previous results. But you really, really are at risk of misleading yourself. And you see this sort of mathematically. You see this also in practice. OK, what can you do? You still want to do science. You still only have a sample. You don't have the underlying distribution. What can you do? So one solution is don't reuse data. Every time you want to issue a query, get yourself a fresh database. And then you no longer have an adaptivity problem. You've no longer selected the query as a function of the data on which it's going to be evaluated. And so you can go back to living in the beautiful world that we started in without adaptivity, except your data needs grow linearly with the number of queries. And that's not so beautiful. Remember, we, we had this sort of hope from before we encountered adaptivity that we were going to be answering exponentially many queries. And now you tell me database size has got to grow linearly. This is terrible news. OK. Another thing that, that you can do is if you're in the sort of fortunate situation where your mechanism's output is compressible to be bits, um, then you can use the observation that a determinic, determin, deterministic analyst uh, would only ever be able to actually explore two to the B queries. And that is going to sort of uh, limit, in some sense, the space that sort of this adaptivity could get you into, and sort of the ways that adaptivity could get you into trouble. And you can leverage that. But if you're not in this situation, what are you supposed to do? OK. So now we have intro to differential privacy, intro to the problem of adaptive data analysis. Now our job is to put the two pieces together. And what I want to do is I remind, want to remind you, differential privacy is really a stability concept. It says that your computation shouldn't be very sensitive to small changes in the underlying data sample. Your computation should reflect the overall patterns, yes, but not the nuances of whether this one, this row or this row was present in your data set. And that's in sense, some sense exactly what we're going to need. And so the flavor of the theorem that we're going to be able to show here is one that says that if you can guarantee that your mechanism is both differentially private and sample accurate for linear queries, then you're going to be able to together get a distribution accuracy guarantee. So you're going to be able to guarantee that for the queries that actually get asked, the answers that your mechanism is going to give are, go are going to be close to the true answers on the underlying distribution. And you can see it sort of looks like a mess of Greek letters, but if you have an epsilon delta differential privacy guarantee and an alpha beta sample accuracy guarantee, basically that alpha and that epsilon go into your uh, distribution accuracy guarantee and that delta and that beta feed into your sort of failure probability there in your, in your distribution accuracy guarantee. Um, that C and that D are used to sort of trade back and forth, um, worry less about those. And so this, if we could show it, is a really nice tool because it says intuitively what? Well, it says if I can figure out how to get a differential privacy guarantee simultaneously with an accuracy guarantee, then I immediately inherit this property that I wanted, that doing science on the sample implies good results on the underlying distribution. And what did we know about differential privacy? That it could answer about quadratically many queries accurately. And you can see already sort of foreshadowing in this guarantee that we give for distribution accuracy. Think of that e to the epsilon minus one. That's basically an epsilon term. So we're basically inheriting that epsilon guarantee right there from differential privacy. And so intuitively where this is heading is that this is going to be a tool for allowing us to answer this adaptive sequence of quadratically many queries with distribution accuracy. Questions before I go on? 
are you going to tell us what the mechanism is? Um, so you can do that. So you can do this with any differential private mechanism. So basically, I can instantiate this for particular differential privacy mechanisms, and basically they enjoy particular accuracy guarantees. And then you just put together their privacy and accuracy guarantees in order to get it sort of an inherited theorem about what the implications are uh, for distribution accuracy. Uh, yeah, but the example you gave with the classification uh, is not an example for which uh, you you gave an example of a good mechanism, a differentially private mechanism. Uh, no, no, and I didn't. Um, so, so you can you can do something like that. It, it didn't quite fit the model. It's true, and so I, it was it was not a perfect example in that regard. Um, but um, formally, what I'm going to show today is for these linear queries, um, you can convert that classification problem into something that looks more like linear queries, but we won't, we won't have time to do that. Um, but okay. you can basically solve that same problem. Okay, so I have limited time to convince you of this. I'll do my best. Okay, so what's the structure generally of, the, of arguments in machine learning um, that say something about being able to do useful science on samples? The structure often takes this sort of triangle inequality kind of an argument. What are the three players here? At the top, we have your goal, which is to answer queries accurately on the underlying distribution. On the bottom right, we have what's the answer of the query on the sample, the data sample that you have. And on the bottom left, we have the thing that we get to play with, which is what is the answer that we give to the query, okay? And if we could somehow guarantee both that the answer that we give is sample accurate, it's pretty close to the answer, the true answer on the sample, and that we're being issued queries on which the sample behaves similarly to the underlying distribution, that's a generalization type of guarantee, then we would know that the answers that we're giving are close to the true answers on the underlying distribution. Okay. So the intuition that is gonna sort of help us out here um, is this intuition that we somehow need to get some control over the changes as we go through these interactions between the mechanism and the analyst, the changes in beliefs that an observer might have about the data sets that could have generated the sequence of observations. So a useful object for us um, for this analysis is going to be the following. Um, given some transcript of observations, so these are the query answer pairs that get generated by an interaction between the mechanism and the analyst, we're going to write Q sub pi, so, P, so, so pi is that transcript of observations, Q sub pi is going to be the posterior distribution on data sets that's going to be induced by having observed pi. So assume you start with the prior that's the true distribution, then you look at how do you update your beliefs about the distribution over data sets after viewing this interaction between the mechanism and the analyst on the sample, okay? It's a weird object so far. The, the thing that we're gonna do with this is that we're gonna introduce some vocabulary for reasoning about queries on this distribution, this posterior distribution. So in particular, we'll say that an interaction is posterior insensitive if what it does is it ensures that with high probability, the queries that get asked are queries whose answers on the underlying distribution are close to their answers on this posterior distribution. This sort of the way that we would have sort of encoded our understanding of what the underlying data set is by observing the interaction between the mechanism and the analyst. Uh, and then similarly- uh, Sorry, are you fixing the set of queries when you do that? So this, no, so the, the analyst is generating the queries. But it's generating them adaptively. Is generating them adaptively, yeah. Yes, but but uh, it's generating them adaptively according to what distribution on the sample you're you're changing now the distribution on the sample. So there's a so there's a there's a so if we start with a distribution over databases, yeah, and then we look at an interaction between 
the, uh, the mechanism and the analyst. So a sequence of query answer pairs that, that sort of interaction causes us to update our beliefs about the distribution over databases. And that induced posterior is this Q sub pi object. Yeah, but the, is this after some fixed number of queries or it's each Yeah, so this is gonna be sort of, yeah, after, after some particular length of interaction. Yeah, I'm not carrying around the length of the interaction here, but say we do K, K rounds of interaction. So you compare the, the behavior of this, uh, of this uh, transcript, you compare it uh, over the initial distribution sampled independently and times to generate a database or uh, a distribution that conditions on the uh, results of this adaptive, you know, number of queries that were asked. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm trying I, to capture here. Sorry, I, I don't quite get this still. Um, I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't match what I'm reading. So so P, P of N, that's, um, that's just the samples, right? That's the imp yeah, yeah. So the that's that's is the S is drawn from the distribution over databases, and we have IID uh, databases for today. Um, the uh, post. I thought we were comparing the distribution database initially, which is some Q. I don't know Q maybe to Q pi, which is the posterior distribution of databases. Uh, but this is like comparing the empirical. Isn't this it? is no. This is comparing. So this is I. Uh, comparing the behavior of the query on the underlying distribution. That's the, the P to the N. Oh, so P, um, P, oh, P to the N, I misunderstood that then. So that's that's a random variable where you pick N. So I could just re replace that by the true distribution Q. Yeah, 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 that, that P to the N is supposed to, to reflect the, the true distribution. Yeah, there's some abusive notation that I'm allowing myself to evaluate queries on the distribution. Okay, so I mean, one thing that maybe is counterintuitive is that I mean, the whole point of the queries is to is to change the, the. Yeah, exactly. The point of queries is to change, in some sense, you know, our, our understanding of things. Um, and so there's going to be some tension here. Um, and so we're going to need also some notion of accuracy. But just, um, just a second, I still uh, also trying to process this. The set QJ, Q1, Q2, up to whatever number QK of queries, is the adaptive set generated on the distribution? Yeah, these are the queries that are generated by the interaction. So these are not arbitrary queries. These are yes, the but they are that generated. Are generated. On, on, they are generated on the original distribution, and then you compare the answers to answers on the conditional distribution uh, pipe. Yes. Yes. This is yeah, the same. This is a non-intuitive yeah. object. If you're if you're feeling yeah, that helped a lot. That actually helped a lot. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Ask more questions. Yeah. Because this is this is an uncomfortable object. So so yeah, QJ. Wait, is, if it, yeah. QJ is uh, a random variable. So the questions you ask on Q pi is, are different, not just the answers. No, they are the same. No, 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 no. no the, 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 the QJs are the same. So the QJs are the ones that were generated on the actual data set. I see. Um, yes. And then we look at that sequence <laughs> of queries generated on the actual data set, okay. Okay. and we evaluate it on the underlying distribution. And we evaluated on the posterior distribution. Okay, I got it, and then I lost it, and I got it again. Okay. okay. Well, let's keep the moment where you got it, because it's a good moment. If, uh, <laughs> if it were one query, there would be no problem. Right? If it were but one query, there would be no problem. Yes. And if there are two queries, the, the second query is generated still according to the original distribution, but we just compare now uh, what the answer would be on, on the conditional distribution. Exactly, but the second query is chosen adaptively as a function of the result on the first query. And that's where we potentially get ourselves into trouble because yeah. now we're looking at a query um, that is potentially encoding information about the data set. Yeah. Yeah, good, okay. And so then the other tool that we're gonna talk about is alpha beta posterior accuracy, which is this comparison um, between the answers that we give to the queries and the values that those queries take on, oh, sorry, there's an I versus a J, but you know what I meant. Um, the, the values that these queries take on, um, on this posterior distribution, okay? And so now we're gonna be able to go back to that triangle. That was the old triangle. We're gonna replace it with a new triangle. This is gonna be our new way of thinking about things. If we can show that our interaction is both, both posterior accurate 
and posterior insensitive, then that's going to imply that the answers that we give are close to the true answers on the underlying distribution. So again, if we can show that the answers we give are close to their answers on the posterior and that they, we induce uh, queries whose answers on the posterior are close to their answers on the underlying distribution, then we can do this triangle inequality. But that, and that's, won't, won't it imply that uh, you learn nothing? We hope not. Because the you know doesn't the so, so they have to be close and the and the sort of the and the action is going to be all in the close in some sense. Um, how how much can you get you know both of these things simultaneously? Um, but if they were really close, then uh, triangle inequality of the whatever is in the next slide or in the previous slide uh, would say that. Uh, it's uh, it's as if you ask the questions on the original distribution, right? Right. And if you it's what uh, if after many queries, uh, the answers you get on the conditional distribution is the same as are very very close to the answers you got on the original distribution. Then in some sense, it means you didn't learn much. Ah, uh, uh, so not the original distribution. So this is this is the weird thing about this thought experiment is that you're comparing the posterior, um, which is you start with the true distribution and you update the true distribution given the information from the interaction. You're comparing the behavior on that. So you start with the true distribution. You're comparing that to the behavior on the true distribution. And it's true that if Q on the true distribution and Q on the posterior were the same, then we wouldn't, I mean, then the, that's, that's simply gonna be impossible because we don't have access um, to, the, to the true underlying distribution. So there's going to be some sort of trying to figure out how can we get both of these sort of two edges in order to ensure this thing that we want, which is distribution accuracy, that the queries that we get um, and answer, we answer them close to their values on the true underlying distribution. Does that make sense? And no. Can you show the previous slide? Yeah. So the, 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 this previous slide? Yeah, this previous slide. Yeah. Suppose, suppose that delta and beta were zero. Okay. Right? And so you are really close in both of these, uh, you know, uh, in, in both um, posterior insensitive and the, uh, you know, uh, the and posterior, posterior accurate, accurate, you know, and assume epsilon and alpha are really tiny. Mm -hmm. So overall, the answers you give are, you know, basically the exact, almost exactly the, uh, answers you would get on the on the original distribution. Exactly, and that's what we want. That's the goal of doing science um, on the sample is to get answers that are somehow magically close to the true answers on the underlying distribution. Oh, sorry, on the underlying distribution as opposed so this is the to data on, the, on, the, which on the, the particular which the sample, sample. sample. Yeah, okay, so. Yeah, yeah so, so we, the despite point having not, actually yeah. only, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, good, good. No, I at least got it. Yeah, so that's what you want. You want. You don't want that there'll be some overfitting to each particular sample. You are bypassing the sample this way. Exactly. Yeah. So this is going to be a tool for trying to understand how can we avoid encoding too much information about the sample in our answers. Oh, good. Because that will result in information potentially being encoded in the future queries, which we've seen as a disaster. Maybe it's good to like think of an example of a bad example where you would like uh, have a bunch of data and you want to show you have in mind you want to show some correlation that's not really exists. So maybe you keep asking questions to try to find maybe there's like two possibilities, you know, good and bad, and they're equally likely. And maybe there's so then there's likely to be some interval where you know the good out or the bad out exceeds the good. And so you're fishing for it. Um, or I don't know, maybe you can come up with a better example. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a good idea. I, I should try to come up with a running example to follow this. Um, particularly the, the sort of reasoning about the, the posterior distribution. Yeah, I think that fishing yeah. is, or what I would call fishing is a good example where you, 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 you want, you know, you come into it in advance thinking that there's some correlation of some kind. Then there's many different ways you can pose it, you know, many different ways you can have a cutoff. And, and so if you try them all, you'll find some statistical significance in the sample, but it won't really be there. So this should if we track this, hopefully we would see 
yeah, this is gonna prevent you from, from, from fishing. It's not gonna prevent you from fishing in the sense of if your fishing is just try all possible correlations where there are exponentially many correlations, it's not gonna prevent you from you know, getting misled uh, because once you're doing exponentially many queries, all bets are off, but it is gonna prevent you from doing this sort of adaptive fishing. Um, yeah, so that's a nice example. Oh, oh, oh sorry, you're, you're right. Yeah, I have to set. Up. You're right. I knew there was something wrong. Yeah, so I have to set it up and adjust. yeah. Yeah, so I should think through that. That's a good idea. Okay, so I'm technically out of time. So you guys should tell me if I should be speeding up or stopping or something. Um, if you don't tell me, I'll just keep talking. Yeah, no, give me an estimate of what you planned, like how. You know. I I would be very happy to have ten more minutes, but if you yeah, tell me five, I'll do five. It. You got okay. it. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so if we can prove these two sides of the triangle, then we have what we want. So if you can show that we have a mechanism that's epsilon delta posterior insensitive, and at the same time that it's post alpha beta posterior accurate, then we're gonna immediately inherit a guarantee of distribution accuracy. So that's gonna be the proof sketch. We need to show somehow how do we get posterior accuracy and how do we get posterior insensitivity and that we can do them at the same time. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna actually show we already have the tools for it. We're gonna show that sample accuracy immediately implies guarantees of posterior accuracy and differential privacy immediately implies guarantees of posterior insensitivity. And so we're gonna be able to deploy accurate differentially private algorithms and immediately inherit guarantees of distribution accuracy. Okay, so I want to sketch in a high level sort of how each of these lemmas comes together. I won't go into full detail for them, but at least hopefully that'll give you some intuition for what's going on here. So for the first one, for the sample accuracy implies posterior accuracy. Um, what's going on here? The key idea behind this lemma is a Bayesian resampling lemma. And I distinctly the, remember the place where I was standing on a street corner in Berkeley when Aaron Roth first mentioned this idea to me because I was just blown away by this. Uh, so what's the idea here? The idea here is you can sort of imagine after this interaction between the mechanism and the analyst runs and it yields some transcript, imagine you were to resample a data set from that induced posterior distribution. This resampling of the data set doesn't change the joint distribution on data sets and transcripts. So the joint distribution on data sets and transcripts that you would get if you look at data sets and the transcripts that they generate versus transcripts generated and the data sets sampled from the posterior, those are the same joint distribution. And this observation is going to allow us to do sort of a clever resampling inside the proof here. So I, I said 10 minutes, so I, I'm not going to be able to fully do this. Um, but the, no, I'm not even going to be able to do this halfway. But that's, okay, the Bayesian resampling, if you can get some taste of the Bayesian resampling, that's, that's the main idea for this piece um, of, the, of the work. For the second piece of this, we want to show that differential privacy gives us a guarantee of posterior insensitivity. And this, in some sense, already kind of maybe fits your intuition for what's going on. What is differential privacy doing for you? It's preventing you from doing things that encode too much about the sample. And that sounds intuitively like it should be very helpful for posterior insensitivity. And so the, the sketch of the proof here is that we, we introduce some vocabulary for talking about bad transcripts. And bad transcripts are transcripts uh, that induce uh, these posterior distributions uh, where the queries behave very differently than the um, on the posterior than on the underlying distribution. But imagine that we could somehow ensure that the joint distribution on data elements and on transcripts is not gonna to be too different from the product distribution on data elements and on transcripts. Um, that's gonna ensure that those bad transcripts are not too likely. 
Um, and basically, this is exactly what differential privacy is going to give us. It's going to ensure that these joint and these product distributions are going to be close to each other. Um, and that is sort of, it's encoding this idea of differential privacy that no one element should be having an outsized influence here. And that's going to be exactly what we need to avoid getting into a bad situation in terms of the induced posteriors. So I realize that was super fast, uh, but you put these all together and you get these consequences uh, for distribution accuracy. Okay, so this is beautiful and cool. This first showed up in this work of Dwarf Feldman, Hart, Potassi, Reingold, and Roth, subsequently improved by Vasily Nassim, Smith, Steinke, Stemmer, and Oldman, based in some sense, or in, uh, sort of grown in relation with these really nice lower bound results of Hart and Ullman and Steinke and Ullman. Um, and this particular sort of way of framing the, the relationship and the particular results here are from this um, paper that I mentioned before. But what's next? What did we learn? So we learned that if you have no adaptivity, you can answer exponentially many queries. If you have adaptivity, sample splitting allows linearly many queries, differential privacy enables quadratically many queries. And it turns out from those lower bounds that I just mentioned that this is in some sense tight, but is this really the best you can do? You can only answer quadratically many queries in the size of your data set. It would seem that we took an overly pessimistic approach to this problem in some sense, right? We use differential privacy, which is this sort of cryptographically paranoid notion, right? It's worst case over all neighboring pairs, worst case over all outcomes, worst case over all data distributions, worst case over all analysts. But what we need for doing statistical data analysis is we don't need something that's worst case, worst case, worst case, worst case. We need good performance for the computations that we're actually doing on the data set that we actually have on hand. And maybe in some sense, these aren't all worst case. Can we do something about this? So in some subsequent work, or sort of, I guess, sort of contemporaneous work, um, Moshe and I just uh, show that you can, in fact, relax the differential privacy notion and still get this sort of full set of implications. But it's a paper that in some sense doesn't really have much bite because we don't have any way to really algorithmically leverage this insight in order to practically answer more queries anywhere. We don't actually know how to do anything with this relaxed definition. Um, but more recently, Moshe and I have been working on ways that we can formally get more analyses in non-worst case settings. And in particular, um, one thing to think about that we um, hopefully will have a manuscript in about a month uh, is what if you're not in a worst case situation with regard to the, your analysts, the queries that are being issued? Can you somehow detect this non-worst case dis and notice that you can handle more queries that are adaptively chosen and make better use of the data? Um, and we have some, I think, nice positive results showing actually how you can do this and handle non-worst case settings. Uh, but I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done here. And I have some, you know, secret hope that actually this at some point will maybe even become a practical toolkit for making better use of, of our collective data and doing better science. I'll stop there. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, guys. That's, yeah, that's great. So uh, let's, let's uh, ask Katrina some questions besides the uh, questions during the talk. Yeah, I'd be glad for more questions. Anybody? So I, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one is the, uh, in the last you know, result you, you mentioned you are writing now, is the mechanism trying to learn the analyst in some sense? Um, the, in, in one version of what we're doing, the mechanism is trying to look over the shoulder of the analyst and trying to keep an eye on whether the analyst is asking problematic queries. Um, which I think you could sort of try to think of is, in some sense, learning the analyst. I, I wouldn't have put I wouldn't have put it that way. Um, more what we're doing is I if either if you know that the queries that are, that are being issued have some certain additional well-behavedness properties 
because it's not written, I probably shouldn't say, you know, say everything out loud and commit myself. Um, or if you can sort of look over the shoulder of the mechanism and observe this well behavedness um, in a fashion that doesn't create new problems for overfitting, then you can leverage this in order to say, actually, we're not in a worst case setting, we can, we can answer more queries. I wouldn't have said that it, it looks exactly like learning the analyst, but I, I can I could see the analogy. And the second question, yeah, okay, that's that's clear. Um, the second question, whether you restricted yourself to linear queries simply because that is the setting for which you get quadratically many queries in the differential privacy uh, part of the proof. It, does does linear, is linearity used in also in the uh, sample uh, accuracy part or not? So I, so they, you can actually go beyond linear queries. Um, they, so you, you can do some sort of sort of basic generalizations of linear queries where you can have sort of weighted combinations in some sense. Um, to do something more general than that, I, the, it's a good question. Where exactly is Yeah, so basically what I'm asking, another way of phrasing is it, uh, do you really care about linear queries or do you just care for some set of queries that you are restricted to for which uh, differential privacy allows you to handle, I don't know, some number F of N queries. It may be quadratic for, uh, you know, the case of linear, but some F of N uh, uh, queries uh, privately and uh, you have the sample uh, accuracy, you know, which is sort of independent of the, but it's not independent of the quiz. Anyway, you have sample accuracy for the same f of n. Would do you get uh, then that you, 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 you your result without any reference to linear? There, so the linear queries assumption is actually being leveraged beyond the fact that it gives you a class for which we know how to get privacy and accuracy simultaneously. It's actually being actively, you can weaken it somewhat, but it's actually being leveraged inside one of the proofs. Um, so there is some additional work to be done if you want to try to state something more general than that. Um, I'm trying to see if I can even point to where it is in the proofs, but I probably, um, it's probably too, too, too much to try to, uh, to try to, I don't think it's really on the slides the, the way that I've abstracted it, but no, it's it's not just that it's a class for which we have these privacy accuracy guarantees. There's there's a little bit more to it. Okay, more questions. Anybody? I went way over, so if asking for more okay. questions, yeah, exactly. That's fine. That's normal in this seminar, Katrina. All okay. right, thanks a lot again. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the questions.